how they line up. And then you look at the hydrogen bomber lines and you take your spectral image and plot and you overlay the bomber lines on it and you can see that this one particular one has all four bomber lines. Um, and so that tells you what the um, classification of star that is. Here's a different image with a spectral plot. Here are the bomber lines. Three of them match up beautifully. This one does not. However, you have these two very strong absorption lines right here. And if you overlay that with the double calcium line, you will see that that lines up perfectly with these two absorption lines. That tells you that is a sunlight star because that strong calcium ionized double line is the indicator for a G-type star. So you need to have a really good understanding of how the stellar classification depends upon temperature and how, what that means for the bomber lines that you see because the bomber lines are very weak for hot star, or non-existent for hot stars. They're also non-existent for cool stars because you have to have uh, energy, you have to have the, the electron transiting down to the bomber line to be able to see um, that particular absorption line. And if the star is too hot, the electron has been ionized, so there aren't any transitions whatsoever. And in a really cool star, there is not enough energy for the electron to ever leave the, um, the, it, its ground state, so nothing can transcend back down to the bomber line, and therefore you can't see any bomber lines in very cool stars. So the, the, the hottest stars are characterized by ionized helium, then you go all the way down through the coolest stars where you see molecules such as titanium oxide can actually exist, entire compounds. And here is another schematic to show how the bomber lines are weak in hot stars. They get the strongest in the A stars, and then they get weaker and weaker until they're off non-existent again in the coolest stars. So here are the image set from this year's event, 2012 event in Orlando. And you can see that there are several images of deep sky objects. There are spectral images here. Uh, this is an HR diagram one. Um, here is uh, a timing one from a, from a pulsar. And there's an HR diagram with locations indicated on it. Now, most of the questions in the event are all geared towards these image sets probably 75% of the exam, you have to look and, and answer, recognize and answer questions about these particular objects right here. So if you have a really good knowledge about the deep sky objects, and if you understand basic spectroscopy and understand the HR diagram and what it's, those plotted stars are telling you, then you have come a really long way to scoring exceptionally well in this event. Like getting a little bit more into the mathematical end a little bit, um, stars are black bodies. Um, all, every single um, emission, all of the emissions, every wavelength being, being emitted from the core of the star is absorbed by the stellar atmospheres, and then they emit it all away. So everything that comes in goes out. That makes them a perfect little radiator, which is a black body. And there are three radiation laws associated with black body radiation. And they are really very, very simple. Planck's law simply tells you that, that the hotter the star, uh, the more energy, it radiates more energy at every single wavelength than a cooler star. You never see this bright line dip below the next coolest star down. It's all, it emits more energy at every single wavelength than a cooler star. And Wayne's law simply tells you that the maximum peak at which a star produces it, 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 its, its radiation, that, max, that maximum peak, you, is dependent upon its temperature. With this little equation right here, you can easily determine the temperature of a star if you know its maximum wavelength or uh, determine its maximum wavelength if you know its temperature. Um, and the Stefan Boltzmann law simply says that the area under the curve is equal to the total power of the star. So the, you can do power in watts. That's not quite as common. 
uh, and you'll see there are two constants, and then you're looking at area and temperature. And if you want to determine the luminosity, which is another measure of the power, it's absolute magnitude, and its luminosity is very closely related, um, then you would use this particular little uh, relationship right here. And again, you can see that the only thing you're interested in, besides the constant, is the temperature and the surface area. Cepheid variables are used to calculate cosmological distances. If you find a Cepheid variable in a galaxy up to approximately 10 to the 7 light years away, you can calculate the distance to that galaxy. Uh, we already talked about uh, plotting the change in brightness over time of a star, and you can then determine the period. Once you know the period, you can look up its luminosity from the period luminosity chart, and the period will tell you how much luminosity it has, you can easily convert luminosity to uh, absolute magnitude and plug it into the distance modulus equation uh, because if you know the intrinsic or absolute magnitude, the apparent magnitude, how bright it appears to be, you can easily determine the distance. That is the most difficult um, math in this event. It does not get any more difficult than that. Uh, the distance modulus we just talked about, Kepler's law, we have a lot of things orbiting each other, and Kepler's laws are not just for planets, they're for any two or more orbiting um, bodies. So Kepler's third law, and just simple relationships for velocity and distance and time. Uh, remember that when we are measuring like diameters of things out there, it, it's angular measurements we're taking from here on Earth. So the small, this, the small angular formula in arc seconds, arc minutes, radians, uh, you can expect to see those uh, units in the event. Um, understand light years and meters and, and AUs, and just simple basic arithmetic.